I've had a lot of people over the years ask me for JRPG recommendations across a variety of systems, and I figured I might as well make some videos about each one. So starting today with the original PlayStation, I'll be sharing essential JRPGs to play on every major game system. And to help kick this series off, I'll be joined by my buddy Shadow Chris, so be sure to check out his channel and subscribe. I also want to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. Stay tuned to learn how you can save 85% and get 3 months free. To kick things off, it's only right to start with one of the greatest JRPGs of all time, Final Fantasy VII. This is the game that popularized JRPGs in the West, and if you still enjoy JRPGs today, you have this game to thank. What made it special at the time was its massive 3D world. There weren't a lot of 3D RPGs at the time, and certainly none at this scale. This was one of the first games I can remember getting attached to characters in a deep way. And what was cool is that you got to know each of these characters during different story beats. For example, you got to know about Red 13 during your first trip to Cosmo Canyon. Of course, Final Fantasy VII has some incredible music from Nobu Uematsu. Whether it's the emotional Aerith theme, the world map theme that evokes a sense of adventure, or the gold saucer theme that just puts a smile on your face. And Final Fantasy VII also had plenty of ways to get distracted. Whether that was trying to go for the gold chocobo, hunting down different limit breaks, or the large amount of gold saucer minigames. It raised the bar not only for RPGs, but also for storytelling and video games. If you enjoy mechs and Gundams, and are looking for a dark, rich JRPG, then Xenogears may just be the game for you. Originally, this was a potential plot for Final Fantasy VII. They decided not to go with it because it was too dark and didn't really match the fantasy side of things. Compared to Final Fantasy VII, this game didn't really have the biggest budget, so their graphics took an interesting turn. Instead of using the 3D sprites of the time, they decided to go with the 2D look instead. In my opinion, this actually makes it look that much better. It stands out, I like to say in a good way. And also, in stark contrast to Final Fantasy VII, they decided to put 3D assets for their backdrops. The 3D assets with the 2D portraits actually make it pop. Xeno Gears really started my love for the whole Xeno saga, and this being a passion project of Tetsuya Takahashi and his wife Soria, both who are really into psychology, and it shows with the themes in this game. Check it out and play it for yourself. While Chrono Cross wasn't exactly the Chrono Trigger sequel everyone was looking forward to, it's still one of PlayStation's best games. And Chrono Cross is also one of the system's most beautiful games. It has such a vibrant, gorgeous color palette. And this pairs super well with the tropical island aesthetic. Not to mention it has one of the greatest video game soundtracks of all time. I think what makes it so incredible is the sheer variety of songs and the eclectic array of instruments. Whether it's the calming Arnie Village theme, the upbeat track of another Termina, or the emotionally resonant piano tune Star Stealing Girl. Chrono Cross also had a lot of cool customization that you didn't see in any game at the time. One thing I really remember being cool were the customizable text box frames. You could find these secrets around the world and change the text box from steel to colored shells. The game also had 45 playable characters, something nearly unheard of for games at the time. And there were just so many different combinations of moves and characters that it was super fun to try to find as many as you possibly could. Chrono Cross is just pure presentational splendor and one you shouldn't miss. Suikoden 2. Man, what a massive game, with so many playable characters. If you're looking for great story and character development, then that's what this game specializes in. Out of all the characters that are playable in this game, there has to be someone for everyone's taste. The sprite use in this game is masterful. Other games of this genre and age reuse sprites a lot, so you just see the same expression over and over again. But in this game, don't be surprised if you see a sprite once, and then never again. Let's talk about the beginning of this game. It really knew how to pull you in. It starts off with two friends who end up having to take a leap of faith and get split up in battle. After this scene, it shows a cinematic flashback of their lives together, all while playing the opening credits. So elegant. The thing is, you, you could tell that they really did focus a lot on character development and story because the battle system wasn't all too special. It basically followed your typical JRPG turn-based combat, but there was also battlefield combat where you are a general commanding your troops. This played out very similar to Fire Emblem's tactical turn-based battle system, and it was definitely an improvement from their previous system which was simply just rock paper scissors. But I'm a sucker for character development, so I definitely think this is a must-have. 
If you looked up JRPG in a dictionary, you'd probably see a picture of Lunar Silver Star Story right next to it. JRPGs are known for their tropes, and most of them started here with Lunar, and I think it's worth playing for that reason alone. In Lunar, you play as Alex, a boy from a small town who gets swept up in an unexpected adventure to become the Dragon Master. From here, you go on a globe-trotting adventure accompanied by childhood friends and one that may become a love interest. This is also one of the few RPGs at the time that had voice acting. Now, by today's standards, it's not great, but it was better than most at the time. Lunar also had some stunning animated cutscenes on the level of animated series at the time. Lunar also had one of the coolest collector's editions you'd ever seen on the PlayStation. It came with a cloth map, the full soundtrack, and a hardbound art book with interviews from the developers. And if that wasn't enough, it has a killer soundtrack and a super fun combat system. Lunar Silver Star Story is the definition of a classic JRPG, and you definitely need to check it out. Oh, Legend of Dragoon, you either love it or hate it. I personally love it, and it holds a nice spot in my heart. I remember when this game first came out, Actually, before it came out, where it was just a demo at my local electronic boutique. When I saw this game, I was just in awe. I mean, I love dragons, and like, I didn't say I was a dragon child, but when I saw the gameplay and the graphics and action, back then, I just needed to play it. This game had a huge budget, and I think the reason it really got a bad name for itself was because it was marketed as the Final Fantasy Killer. The combat for its time was pretty original, using a system called additions where you must hit the X button to match two squares. It really makes all those battles that much more engaging. And this game is jam packed with content, four whole discs. And you know how the fourth disc is usually just the final boss? No, this one is packed to the brim. Also, did you grow up watching Power Rangers? Cause this game gave me major Sentai feels. When your characters get all powered up in their Dragoon forms, you know the battle's on. Valkyrie Profile is worth playing for how unique it was at the time and how certain features have inspired games even today. In the game you play as Leneth, a Valkyrie on a mission to collect the souls of fallen heroes to serve as her companions during Ragnarok. The gameplay is broken up into three segments. One where you're flying around the world map, two where you're dungeon crawling, which is essentially 2D platforming, and three, the turn-based combat. What Valkyrie Profile is most well known for and what makes it a must-play JRPG is the combat. The combat in Valkyrie Profile is turn-based, but what makes it unique is that each character in your party is assigned to a face button. So the strategy is learning how to time moves together to create combos and keep enemies on their toes. There are 24 playable characters in total, which makes for plenty of customization and different ways you can combo moves together. Admittedly, it is a little difficult and there is a bit of a learning curve, but if you're willing to invest the time, it's totally worth it. Now, if you want to track down an original PS1 copy, it's extremely expensive at around $250 right now, but you can find it on mobile or you could play the enhanced PSP port Valkyrie Profile Lenneth. But no matter how you find yourself playing it, it's totally worth it. Do you enjoy a little Western in your JRPG? As a Trigun fan myself, you know I do. You have three main characters in the beginning to choose from, each with their own lush and compelling backstory. Similar to Legend of Zelda, each party member has certain items in the game that will help you solve puzzles. But just because it's a Western at heart, don't you fret. There's still those weird looking JRPG-esque enemies in it, and tons of them. It still follows a very JRPG formula, but man, that soundtrack. I feel like sound in a game, especially back then, was extremely important. It really takes you somewhere, and when you hear that soundtrack play all over again, all the memories start flooding back. The game's world map is also extremely fun to explore. It encourages you to seek out special areas that are not easily visible on the map. Even though it's a PlayStation 1 game, the graphics do remind me more of a Super Nintendo title. And you know what, I'm actually kind of glad that they used this art style because the 3D polygons didn't really age well. Vagrant Story is a game whose significance might be lost on some players today, but it pushed the envelope in so many incredible ways at the time that it just had to be on this list. Its main selling point at the time was its presentation. How it presented the game at the time with lots of camera movements made it more dynamic, especially compared to more stiff presentation styles of even Final Fantasy. Vagrant Story's characters also had animated faces, something you almost never saw for RPGs at the time, outside of cinematics. This was also one of the few big budget RPGs that did not employ pre-rendered backgrounds. Now for those of you who don't know, this was a technique used at the time to give a game scale while saving on memory. Now that you know why it's important, let's actually talk about the game a bit. In the story, you play as Ashley Riot, who is wrongly accused of murder. You're now tasked to solve the mystery behind this conspiracy. 
The gameplay was less about town hopping and exploring, but more about dungeon crawling and puzzle solving. The combat system was a unique action hybrid system where you could freeze time and focus on certain body parts. You also had to manage a risk gauge to avoid big damage. This almost worked like a stamina meter. The music was also composed by the legendary Hitoshi Sakamoto, whose work includes Valkyrie Chronicles, Final Fantasy XII, and Final Fantasy Tactics. On this list, Grandia has to have one of the more intuitive fighting systems that I've seen. It uses the Active Time Battle System, or ATB for short. This means you get to move around the field and unleash strategic fury. There's a good bit of strategy in these battles. It makes things feel that much more rewarding when you win, such as being able to cancel a massive energy attack and making it out untouched. And unlike some of the other games on this list, it's way more lighthearted than your typical JRPG of the time. This really makes it stand out and adds to one of the reasons why I truly love it. Also, another thing I love, no random encounters. All the enemies can be seen there on the overworld. You can choose to fight them or avoid them altogether. You're probably going to want to fight them though. But overall, what really gets me about this game is the character interactions and the development. The main characters are kids. They actually act like kids and it makes the story that much more believable. If you're looking for a fun, cute, but still epic adventure, then check this game out. And I also want to give a big thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. Surfshark is a top of the line VPN service that helps secure your data online. On average, we spend six to eight hours online every day, so it's important to make sure our private data is protected from malware and hackers. And have you ever had a conversation with someone only to see an ad for that exact same topic later that day? Well, with Surfshark VPN, your data is protected, so websites can't send you creepy ads like that. And with Surfshark, you can also access movies and shows not available in your region. I've been really looking forward to watching Ready Player One, but it's not available on Netflix in the US. However, if I log into a Canadian server and refresh the page, then boom, it's ready to watch. So make sure your online data is secure with Surfshark today. And if you use the promo code GAMINGSHELF, you can save yourself 85% and get three months free. Link is in the description. And I also want to give a big thanks to Shadow Chris for collabing on this video. Now if you enjoyed this and want to learn more about other systems must play JRPGs, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any system. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.